Okay, so we are in uh, 1 Samuel. This is a, a fairly familiar book, more so probably than um, Leviticus or Numbers to most people. And um, it's an, I know it's a favorite of uh, Brett's, Brett, or his first and second Samuel books that, uh, that stand out to him. And so, uh, anyway, so it's kind of too bad in a way that I'm teaching it, but you know we agreed on that, so I think you'll be doing Second uh, Samuel next week. But um, but as we've been uh, seeing uh, of last week, we talked about Ruth and how that bridges really that period. Uh, it really goes along with Judges of that period from the conquest and then the devolving through the period of the Judges when there is no king in Israel. Everyone does what's right in their own eyes, and that's the context of Samuel. And then Ruth bridges over and says, okay, during this time, this is where human sinfulness gets, um, and the, the failure of Israel to really take conquest and be what God has called them to be, um, there's the, the hope of that God is still at work, uh, that there is a remnant, there are people who are believers who are being faithful to the Lord, and that the Lord is, is using them and working in their lives to get to. The last word of Ruth is in uh, 422 is the word David. It ends with a genealogy of saying, now we have, God is moving forward his plan to the right kingly uh, line. And then we end up with the first book of Samuel. Um, As far as authorship, Samuel probably contributes quite a bit to it. The uh, problem with Samuel being the author of the entire book of Samuel, which would really include 1st and 2nd Samuel, is, um, is that Samuel dies in... Uh, the end of 1 Samuel. So there's a lot more history, theology, and stuff going on uh, beyond him. So somebody else. But Samuel starts a, uh, and has, has a school of the prophets. He has other disciples and people who collect Israel's uh, history and, uh, and are Israel's teachers. And so they, uh, probably someone of that group, maybe um, contributors like Nathan, uh, the prophet who confronts Dave and other people, uh, would be good uh, candidates for writing uh, 1 Samuel. And so where we begin is not actually right away with David, um, but we begin with the period of the judges and the, the state of kind of Israel during that time and, and the priesthood, the uh, devolving of Israel's priests, uh, and also even just with an individual uh, family that's going to uh, set up uh, for, for uh, Samuel. And that's uh, in First Samuel one one. Just to introduce the book, it talks about now there was a certain man from uh, uh, Ramathane Zophim from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, uh, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, uh, an Ephraimite, and he had two wives, and the name of one was Hannah, and the other uh, name of the other was Penina. Uh, and Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. So we get this zoom into this individual family of this man with these two wives. One is able to conceive and have children, and one is barren. And what we start to see here is um, somewhat we saw this with, uh, if you read in Judges, you see this with Samson's mother. You see this with Sarah, uh, Sarah and Abraham, when they have Isaac. You see this, not in it as a direct way, but the wording is similar with, uh, with Moses. And then you see this in the, the New Testament. There's kind of this motif set up for God intervening in the lives of women who are barren to give birth to significant individuals. So that's why when you get to somewhere like Luke 1, it starts with uh, Elizabeth and Zacharias, uh, barren of the believing remnant. Uh, older, not able to have kids, and then they give birth to uh, John the Baptist with the assistance uh, of God. And then that even speaks to the significance of Jesus' birth, where it's totally by uh, divine intervention, a, a virgin uh, birth. So we have this, uh, this setup of, of God intervening within an individual family to bring about somebody who's going to contribute to um, to biblical uh, redemptive history. Um, and so within this family, there's, there's problems. There's conflict between, uh, I mean, they shouldn't have two wives, but there's conflicts between these two wives. There's the conflict of one can have children, the other can't. 
Uh, there's the conflict of Hannah is actually the favored wife, even though she can't have children, um, and uh, Penina is not. And so there's you know, not, a, not a perfect uh, setup here in this, this individual family. Um, but they were going up to the place before Jerusalem is the capital. The Ark of the Covenant is located at Shiloh, and so this is sort of the provisional uh, capital of worship. Um, and so in one three, it describes, now this man would go up uh, from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to Yahweh of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests before Yahweh there. And when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina and his wife uh, and all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly and irritate her because Yahweh had closed her womb. So we see that uh, interfamily uh, conflict. And said, and it happened after, year after year. As they went up to the house of Yahweh, she would provoke her, so she wept and would not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you, uh, and why are you, is your heart sad? Am I not better than ten sons? So... <laughs> Real helpful uh, analysis here. But anyway, you know, I don't know, good enough? Um, anyway, then Hannah rose, eating and drinking in Shiloh. Uh, now Eli the priest was sitting by the seat by the doorpost of the temple of Yahweh. So Hannah goes, uh, this family goes yearly to, uh, to worship. There were uh, certain times of the year when at least all the men had to go up and worship at the center where God had caused his name to dwell, which would be later Jerusalem, but here it's Shiloh where the Ark of the Covenant is, and they would offer the sacrifices, uh, they would interact with the priests, and the priests would offer the sacrifices, so this would um, include Passover, or the, the Day of Atonement, um, or the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, there were certain uh, yearly appointed times to go up and do this. So the whole family would go. Um, and so Hannah, during this time, is, is, going, and, uh, is, is going to uh, pray because of her distress. So she goes and prays. She doesn't know Eli um, is around during this time. But she goes to, uh, to pray and is praying intensely before God in 110. It says, she greatly distressed, prayed to Yahweh, and wept uh, bitterly, and she made a vow, saying, O Yahweh of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant, and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to Yahweh all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come upon his head, meaning he will be it's called a lifelong uh, Nazarite, which means you serve a certain vow before the Lord, which could be a short period of time, where you'd say, okay, until this vow is done, um, I'm going to not cut my hair, I'm not going to do this and that, until uh, the job is complete. Um, or you could be a lifelong uh, Nazarite, somebody who is going to uh, serve the Lord, have a vow before the Lord continually. And so Hannah says to the Lord, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you. And obviously this is going to be Samuel that God is going to use uh, to set up for the right king, that Samuel's going to be uh, a priest, he's going to be a prophet, he's going to be a judge, but he's also going to be a kingmaker. He's going to be the anointer uh, of kings and the spiritual leader uh, for Israel. And so as, uh, as Hannah is praying this uh, intensely and alone with the Lord, it says, now it came about that as she was praying before Yahweh that, uh, that Eli was watching her mouth, praying, you know, mouthing the words but not saying anything out loud and crying. And of course he thinks uh, that she's drunk. And so he's like, why are you sitting and drinking, you know, and like this uh, in the house of God? So he goes out to confront her. It says, how long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. And she says, no, my Lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit and have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before Yahweh. Do not consider your maidservant as a worthless woman. But until now, uh, out of great provocation, great concern, I have prayed. Uh, then Eli answered and said, go in peace and may God of Israel grant you your petition that you have asked of him. So Hannah goes and is... Uh, kind of confirmed that the Lord is going to uh, to answer her prayer. And so at this point, now Samuel is born. It describes here this language which becomes familiar 
uh, in the Bible that the Lord uh, enables her to conceive and she gives birth to a son, gives birth to Samuel, um, and then has Samuel with her uh, while he is growing up until he's basically able to be weaned, basically be able to be separated from his mother. And then she hands him over to, uh, to Eli to live in uh, the priestly service, to live in the, uh, among the Ark of the Covenant, to learn how to be a priest. And she uh, comes back and visits him, but he basically is raised by, uh, by Eli. Okay, but the problem with Eli um, is Eli is an ineffective, incompetent uh, priest who allows his sons to do uh, evil. And Eli is described, and it's not making fun of him, but Eli is described as being uh, very overweight. And that's because uh, during this time, it will describe this uh, as it goes on, talks about his sons taking the meat out of the, um, out of the pan when they're supposed to be offering it and stealing it for themselves. And so that's indicated that Eli is, is participating in this as well, that the people are bringing offerings, they're stealing it for themselves. His sons, uh, Hophni and Phinehas, are, are fornicating in, uh, in the tent of meeting. They're doing all sorts of things. They're corrupting the people. They're stealing from the people. They're defrauding. And so what we see is there, during this time of the judges, you have a corrupt priestly line, the line of Eli, and God tells Eli through a prophet, I'm removing you. You're going to be done. And so what we see, though, is the moving of things to the right priest, to Samuel, who will be the anointer of kings. Um, but also the, the idea is to get to the right king and the right kingly line with David, first you need the right, uh, right priests. You need the people who will set up for uh, the system of worship to get to um, establishing the right king. And so um, Samuel is, is brought back, uh, just read Hannah's uh, words when he's, he's young. Um, and so he's brought back uh, in 126, he says, uh, Oh my Lord, as my soul lives, my Lord, I am a woman who stood here beside you praying to Yahweh. Uh, for this boy I prayed and Yahweh has given me my petition I asked of him. So I have dedicated him to Yahweh. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to Yahweh and he worshiped Yahweh there. So now he will be raised by, uh, by Eli. Um, and kind of surprisingly, Samuel grows up to, uh, to be a righteous man and to actually know the Lord, um, even though he's raised by, by Eli, who has his problems. He's not as bad as his sons. But uh, even in that environment, Samuel grows up to, uh, to know the Lord and to uh, be an effective uh, leader. Chapter 2, uh, Hannah sings a song, he writes a song, uh, a prayer of praise to God for what he has done in this act. And it, it looks beyond even just, yes, I wanted a kid and now I have a kid. It looks to God uses these events in her individual life to have an impact <clears throat> on larger redemptive history that God can overturn uh, the whole system of how the world works. Um, and it's actually in um, 1 Samuel 2 that we get the first year w use in the Bible of the word uh, Messiah. In 2.10, we get that word at the end. It's translated his anointed, but it could be his uh, Messiah. And so uh, just listen to what uh, Hannah prayed. It says, then Hannah prayed and said, my heart exalts in Yahweh. My horn is exalted in Yahweh. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let your arrogance come out of your mouth. For Yahweh is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. Uh, the bows of the mighty are shattered, he, uh, but the feeble gird on strength. So we see God is turning everything about how the world works over through his uh, through his actions, through his kingdom. And in verse 5 it says, those who were full uh, hire themselves out for bread, those who were hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren gives birth to seven, but she who has many children languishes. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. Yahweh makes poor 
uh, and rich. He brings low and also exalts. He raises poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He makes uh, to make the, uh, them sit with nobles and inherit the seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are Yahweh's, and uh, he set the world on them. He keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked are silenced in darkness. For not by might shall man prevail. Those who contend with Yahweh shall be uh, shattered. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. Yahweh will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king, and will exalt the horn of his anointed, or his Messiah. So we get even this messianic uh, psalm that's going to set up for when Elizabeth gives her psalm of praise in Luke, and then Mary gives her psalm of praise in Luke for conceiving Jesus. And there's themes that uh, tie in here that talk about God works in this way to bring about his kingdom, and through his Messiah, he's going to change everything around about how the world works and provide a worldwide uh, kingdom in, in the fact of what Jesus will, uh, will accomplish. And Israel, remember, doesn't even have a king at this time. God is their king. But the idea here is that he says that at the end, the Lord is going to judge the ends of the earth. This is going to have a worldwide effect, his kingdom. He's going to give strength to his king and uh, uh, exalt the horn of his Messiah, his anointed. And so that this is all going to be centered in the right king, um, in the Messiah. And we can even notice in 2.6, talks about the Lord kills and the Lord makes alive. Uh, he brings down to Sheol and raises up, right? So the idea of Jesus <coughs> rising from the dead reverses how all of human history has worked, right? That uh, there's sin in the world, there's death, but because of God's work in, uh, in his anointed, in the Messiah, he's able to reverse uh, the course of how everything has, has worked. That's why Jesus is uh, the judge of the world. So Hannah speaks this, this psalm that's going to kind of set uh, the agenda uh, for the rest of uh, this book, the kind of messianic expectation. A few phrases just to draw some uh, attention to here is uh, at the end where it said um, that phrase uh, in 210 where it says he will judge to the ends of the earth. That's a phrase to take note of in the Bible uh, that gets used a lot, particularly in the Psalms and Isaiah to talk about um, the, the Davidic king, the Messiah. His rule is ultimately going to affect and go to the ends of the earth. The glory of God will go to the ends of the earth. Um, so that's something to take note of for the rest of uh, studying the Old and New Testament. It's also in the language of Jesus. Acts 1.8, he sends them not just to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth, right? So that there's this uh, expansion of uh, Jesus' kingdom uh, to the ends of the earth. And so uh, when that phrase comes up, you can realize it's, it's through uh, God's appointed king in the, in the Messiah. Um, but we haven't even gotten there yet. We haven't even gotten to, Israel doesn't have, uh, have that type of king yet. So to move on, uh, Samuel is growing up in this context. It talks about the sons of Eli, it describes their corruption. Eli's not dealing with this. Um, I always appreciated when uh, we talked about this. I remember a few times ago at men's Bible study a while ago of, of Eli's confrontation. To his credit, he does confront his sons in their sin when they come and fornicate in the tent of meeting and all these different things and steal from the people. But uh, the way that my dad kind of put Eli's voice of, oh, no, no, it's not good, my sons. The vo this is not good that you're doing this. You know, just he never um, holds them fully accountable to, to what it is, the weight of, of their, uh, their evil, their corruption. And it says that in, uh, in, sec uh, in 1 Samuel 2 that, that God desired to put them to death, that he was, he was going to let their sin run to a certain extent. Then he was going to put them to death, hold them uh, account accountable. Um, but Samuel's growing up, talks about him uh, growing up before the Lord, being visited by, uh, by Hannah. There's a cute little verse in here that talks about her making a little ephod for him, a little priestly uh, robe for him, for little, uh, little Samuel. I taught this priestly in... Priestly Yeah, when I, <laughs> when I taught this in... Uh, 
uh, by class uh, to to tenth graders. All the girls were like, "Oh, look, his little," mom. you know. So, uh, but anyway, so um, so but Eli gets some bad news from another person saying God is is going to hold you accountable as well, Eli. Uh, during this time, we get the kind of well-known story in, in uh, Samuel, First uh, Samuel three. As Samuel's a little older, he goes to sleep. And it's said during this time that a, a word from the Lord is uncommon. So you don't have God directly speaking to people in this direct of a way right now like you have with some of the judges. The spirit is on them and, and angel of the Lord comes to them and, and speaks to them. But you don't really have this direct of a relationship with a prophet since Moses. And so Samuel is um, such a pivotal individual of someone who is... Um, will have that close relationship uh, with the Lord. But it says at this time um, that Samuel grew up um, and in verse uh, 1, but it talks about the word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. Um, and it talks about in 3.7 that now Samuel did not yet know Yahweh, nor the word Yahweh uh, had, been, had not yet been revealed to him. So he didn't know the Lord yet. Uh, in that direct and personal of a way. But we know the story. Samuel is going to sleep. He sleeps by the, uh, nearby the ark. And Eli sleeps a few rooms over, and God calls to Samuel, and Samuel gets up and goes into Eli and says, yes. And he's like, no, I didn't call you. You must have been dreaming. Go back to sleep. And multiple times. And then uh, Eli finally realizes, wait, okay, this is something different. Uh, go back and say, if you hear it again, Say, speak, Lord, for your servant listens, your servant uh, hears. And so uh, Samuel does uh, respond uh, to, to the Lord uh, that way. In 3.11, he says, uh, and then God says to him in 3.11, uh, Yahweh said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do in a thing of Israel, which both uh, ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end for I have told him what I am about to judge his house forever and the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them therefore I have sworn uh, to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for in the sacrifice and offering forever and so now Samuel's given a pretty tough mission of he's having now to communicate to Eli, who's been like a father figure to him, you're done. God is going to hold you accountable. God's going to judge you for not confronting your sons, not listening uh, to the Lord. So God's going to kind of get rid of the imposter uh, priesthood, group of priests, to replace it with a better uh, priesthood uh, run by Samuel. It's also interesting to note that Eli and his uh, sons, while they're acting as priests and uh, could have theoretically been different if they were obeying God, um, they're not of that uh, priestly line from, uh, from Phineas, from uh, the, the older Phineas in, in Numbers. They're not of that, uh, that grouping um, that's in that, uh, that is the right priesthood. So God is removing uh, removing them. And so um, Eli seems to respond in a way that, that seems humble at first. He says in 3.18, it is Yahweh, let him do what seems good to him, meaning he's not going to change. He just says, okay, well, if God's going to do what uh, God's going to do. Um, but now we've had God has broken the silence here. And God shows through the next chapters that he is Israel's true king. He's not controlled by them. He's not their good luck charm. And that they don't need a king besides him. Now, he would appoint a king. It talks about this in Deuteronomy 17. But uh, God is and has always been their true king, but they don't recognize him as being their king. As he's all that they uh, need, but they don't appreciate God for that reason. And so in chapter 4, the Philistines attack Israel, and they are fighting against them, and Hophni and Phinehas take the Ark of the Covenant into the battle to try to control and manipulate God in order to bring about this victory. The Philistines recognize the Ark in chapter 4, and they say, that's the God that split the Red Sea and beat Egypt. That's the God that 
caused them to have victory over the kings of the land and in the conquest. So the Philistines are actually recognizing more about God, even though they're interpreting the ark as being God. They're recognizing God and respecting God more than the Israelites are. And, I, you know, it's ironic here in chapter 4 that the two worst guys to carry the ark in are like, okay, God's here to save us all. You know, these two bad guys are the ones bringing in the ark uh, to save the day. And there's a double irony here because the Philistines, once they see the ark, they're saying, we're dead. We better fight really hard to try to make it out. And God allows, I mean, this is such a disaster for them. God allows the ark of the covenant to be taken by the Philistines and allows the Philistines to break through so that they can raid, you know, the cities and all sorts of things uh, related to that type of warfare. Um, 4.11, it talks about the ark of God was taken and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas died. Eli gets the news, of course, falls backward and breaks his neck. And it, the Bible here is, uh, is uh, subtly places the point that he is crushed under his own weight. The, you know, he, he'd been taking the food, all this stuff from the, the sacrifices like he shouldn't have been doing, and he's crushed under his own weight. And the Hebrew word for weight is actually the word, similar word group for the word glory. So since he didn't recognize God's glory, he's now crushed under his own weight, his own glory. And so there is this um, total uh, traumatic disaster uh, that takes place during this time. Israel's besieged by the Philistines. The ark is gone. And um, uh, 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 Hophni and Phinehas, one of their wives, gives birth prematurely and names the son uh, Ichabod in uh, 421, which means uh, no glory. The glory is gone. You know, that we've now lost uh, the symbol of God's presence, authority, all these things. And we treated God like a good luck charm. We thought we could, it's in uh, Samuel, they, in the ancient Near East, they thought that you could, gods were more pow- powerful in different regions, like a cell phone tower. And they thought that if you could move your God to the right spot, he would be more powerful. So a God would be least powerful in a foreign land, this and that. So they, uh, Hophni and Phinehas and the people thought, we'll get a better signal on God if he's right here uh, with us. We'll try to manipulate God to win uh, this battle on our behalf, even though we're not uh, obeying him. And God allows the Philistines to beat them. But God is going to now communicate to the Philistines that no, I'm God everywhere. I allowed the Israelites to be beaten because of their sin, but that's not because I lost. That's not because I'm not powerful. So now the main character for chapters four through six is the Ark of the Covenant. We actually, if this was a movie, you'd be following not Samuel, not Hannah anymore, not Eli, but the Ark for chapters four through six. And it takes, uh, the Philistines take the Ark uh, into um, Uh, into their land. They put it in the temple of their half-man, half-fish god, Dagon, among their other gods. And uh, it's it's pretty funny is that they have the uh, ark there and they come in the next day and Dagon is on his face laying down before the ark. And it's, you know, where, which this is in their land, in their temple where their gods are supposed to be the strongest. And it looks like Dagon is bowing down before, you know, Yahweh. And they're like, Okay, so they set Dagon back up, which is, again, Samuel's making a point that's like, yeah, their God has to be helped back up because uh, it's not a true God. And, uh, and then they uh, come in the next day, Dagon's arms are cut off and his head is cut off laying down in front of the ark, which is, you know, he's broken, doesn't exist. But also the fact is, if you, in battles in the ancient Near East, if you were going to really humili- humiliate someone, you would... Uh, uh, tear up the corpse, you'd cut off the hands, you'd cut off the head, you know, that type of thing. And so that's what happened to their God. Um, and so they start kind of playing with the ark. They don't want it near them anymore, so they kind of start playing hot potato with the ark. And they move it to different places, but wherever it goes, they have tumors on them. They get sick. It has this effect where God is putting plagues on them, and the people are saying to their leaders, This is what happened to the Egyptians. God is God everywhere, and now he's bringing plagues on us like the Egyptians. We need to get rid of this thing. And it, it's funny in chapter 8 because the leaders are like, 
let's get together and have a meeting about what we need to do about the ark. And then it's like a couple months later that they finally decide uh, to get rid of it. So they put the ark on a cart um, with a uh, young, um, with a mother of, of, uh, of young calves. And so her instinct would be to run back toward her babies, her newborn babies. So they're like, okay, if she goes this way back into the uh, city where her, her young are, then we know this is maybe a coincidence. If she goes out the other way toward, uh, toward Israel, we know that, yeah, this was from God. And so sure enough, the ark takes itself back all the way to Israel. They, the Philistines return it, but they recognize um, you know, who God is uh, through this. God even teaches them and shows them, no, I'm God everywhere. But when it gets back, a lot of people, because of their handling of the ark in Israel, don't want to take it. They end up dying. They end up uh, not honoring God, not honoring what God said the ark was for, or how to transport it, and these different things. And so there's this question in 620 where they ask, who is able to stand before Yahweh, this holy God, and to whom shall uh, he go uh, up from us? Uh, so they sent messengers. Uh, and so God, uh, so basically the Philistines recognize this. Um, the, the ark returns itself, but nobody even in Israel can handle the ark, the symbol of God's presence, the, where the sacrifice, the day of atonement is supposed to take place. All this is going on. Um, so the ark is remains in a place where it's uh, kind of press pause, suspended uh, on that issue until uh, 2 Samuel um, 6, where David is going to try to move the ark, and he's going to you know, not move it the right way either, uh, and learn some, some things about how he's treating God and honoring God as king. Um, but during this time in chapter 7, God allows Israel to have a victory temporarily over the Philistines. They'll continue to be uh, an issue for them. But Samuel continues to grow up in, in 7.15. It says, now Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And then he would go on kind of a circuit of judgment, um, giving his, you know, he'd be kind of the Moses kind of top figure to um, judge between cases and stuff that were too hard to decide and lead Israel in worship, um, speak on God's behalf, and so he's really the last judge. So he's the one that's perfect to bridge Israel to the period of, uh, of the kings. But Israel is going to have a king, but they're going to demand a king first in chapter 8 for the wrong, uh, the wrong reasons. They're going to demand a king uh, besides God for their own uh, purposes. And so Samuel is judging over Israel, and they... Uh, talks about his sons actually don't walk in his ways uh, in chapter 8, so they're, they're corrupt as well. But in 8.5, they say, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like the nations. Now, if you remember just the chapters before, God doesn't need a king to fight the nations for them. God is already doing fine even without them. You can see that with the narrative with the ark. God has always been their king. But they're like, no, we want to be like the pagan nations. We want to have a king like that. And Samuel says, God has always been your king. I've been your judge. What, you have, have nothing to uh, complain about. Uh, Exodus 15, when they came out of um, the Red Sea, they sang a song. They talked about God is a great king over all the earth. And his kingdom uh, will reign forever. All these things they said about God. And now they're saying, no, that's, that's not sufficient, Samuel. You're old. You're not going to, it's not doing the job for us. We need to be like the pagan nations. Um, and so Samuel takes this personally, is angry, and goes before the Lord. And God is going to um, teach them by giving them what they ask for. You know, sometimes God's gracious to us when we pray for something and he withholds it. And we say that even if it's not a bad thing, sometimes it's like you ask for it and you're like, I'm glad that God didn't give me that. Um, but God sometimes also disciplines and teaches by giving people what they ask for to show them, yep, this is what that's going to be. Um, and so he's told uh, by God in 8.7, listen uh, to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me 
from being king over them. Like all the deeds which they have done since the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt, uh, in that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now listen to their voice. However, you shall solemnly uh, warn them uh, and tell them of the procedure, the custom of a king who will reign over them. So Samuel's going to give them a little bit of a uh, government, you know, political science lesson here on, okay, this is a different type of government. This is what a king like the nations will mean. He's going to, uh, Israel has a tithe. They, they donate, they give 10%, donated to God to upkeep the, the system of the Levites, the sacrificial system, all this. He says the king's going to view himself like that. He's going to ask for 10%. He's going to require your sons and daughters to serve the apparatus of what he's doing. They won't have full claim over themselves. When he goes into wars, he's going to require uh, your sons to go fight in battles and others who remain home to serve uh, from the home front to kind of uh, back up that campaign. And you will not have a choice to not participate in that. Where in Deuteronomy it said that uh, if people were going to go to a war against a city, that you were supposed to send home those who were afraid, send home those who were newly married, send home anyone who didn't want to fight. And so anyone who uh, didn't want to participate could leave. Now the king would say, nope, you're in this fight, whether you know, it's, a, it's a good one or not. And so he tells them all this stuff and they say, sounds great. Let's do that. All right, sign me up. Um, <laughs> and I, I've said this before, but I have used to feel when I would teach in my government class, kind of like Samuel, I'd say, okay, well, here's kind of what this, you know, uh, type of thing, you know, whatever topic we were talking about, maybe it was a form of government or something. This is what this would entail, or this is what, you know, it, it looks like. And they're like, yeah, I don't really see the problem with that, you know, so it just, people have different sensibilities than I do, and that's fine, but it's just kind of like, you know, I'm like, well, I was putting it in kind of a negative light, but everyone was, uh, was going for it. But Samuel's like, okay, and God allows them to have a king, um, they will repent after the, about this and say, what should we do now? We shouldn't have asked for that. Um, and Samuel says, what you do now is what you always should have been doing. Obey the Lord. doesn't matter that there's now a new system. You just continue to obey the Lord. But he says, it was wrong for you to ask for it in the way that you did, but God is going to uh, work uh, within that. Okay, so he talks about this, and uh, let me just read um, just a statement of Samuel to the people from, uh, it's a little bit earlier, from chapter 7. Just his, uh, you can kind of hear his heart for what the people need to be doing in general. In 7, 3, and 4, he says, If you return to Yahweh with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth uh, from among you, and direct your hearts to Yahweh and serve him alone. He will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So Israel removed the Baals, the Ashtaroth, and served Yahweh alone. So Samuel is always calling them to repentance, serve the Lord with all your heart, remove the false gods, and then God gives what he promises. So, but then, of course, they ask for uh, a king uh, rather than God or in place of God. And so in chapter 819, their response after Samuel gives them kind of a lesson of what this would be, he says, no, but there shall be a king over us that we may also be like all the nations that our God uh, may judge us, uh, uh, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Israel is supposed to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, but they're like, no, we want to be like the other nations. We're not, not good enough that we're a nation that's uniquely called out and created by God. We want to be like everyone else. So God gives them the king of human choice. In chapters 9, really through 11, he gives them Saul. Uh, he gives them the king who is, it says, He's the people's choice over and over and over again. It, it articulates this um, about Saul, that he's the king that they chose. And um, so he's described through here what we're going to see. I've got the moth line up here again. Um, what we're going to see is the king of human choice, Saul. God does allow him to be king. Uh, to show Israel what that's going to look like, to be contrasted with a king who is God's choice, which is David. Um, who Samuel will anoint, but it will take a long time for God to uh, move him uh, to the throne. And so it introduces Saul in chapters 9 through 11. Uh, it kind of describes Saul in terms of not being super competent, 
not being really godly, um, being kind of directed by what other people tell him, and not, um, not really being an effective leader. In fact, there's parallels uh, a lot between Saul's behavior and a lot of the behavior of the judges. A very similar language in different uh, passages uh, lays that out. But God does have in chapter 9, Samuel anoints Saul as king, and people are impressed by Saul because he's head and shoulders taller than everybody else. So he's a you know, physically impressive guy. Um, but what's going to be interesting, so it always talks about Saul's outward appearance. God's going to look for a king who is going to be a man after his own heart. But even with David, it gives in 1 Samuel 16, it describes his appearance a little bit. David's handsome. He has a uh, red face. He uh, is, is good looking. So it's saying, it gives us a little hint that, yeah, sometimes David is, while he's the right man and the man after God's own heart, he doesn't have a perfect heart either. He's the one who is um, sometimes just external as well. And so it's interesting, we don't get any description by what the Gospels don't say about Jesus, right? Isaiah 53, no stately form or majesty, that Jesus is totally the, the right king, the right heart. He's all about his heart for, uh, for God, um, not about his physical appearance or what other you know, things that people would think would make him uh, a good king. And so Saul becomes king in chapters uh, 10 and 11, some narrative that describes there. In chapter 11, uh, there's the Ammonites uh, take over an area uh, near Saul's family, and they basically say that, like, uh, they basically say, if all the men of the city cut out their right eye, we'll have peace with you, or if not, we'll make war and we'll kill you, which means they need to debilitate themselves, be ineffective. So this crisis is going on in Israel. Saul is king, and he's out getting his cows lined up in his farming. Like all this is going on and he's not leading at all. Now God does allow him to go and fight and win a battle. But we do see that, um, that he's basically uh, doesn't pick the right timing for things. He's like, well, Israel's falling apart. There's this, this moment of crisis and attack. He's like out there kind of just in his field doing his own thing. And so he's, he's not really the, the right uh, leader in this sense. In chapter 12, I mean, Samuel kind of retires. He gives his last sermon, uh, which is encouraging uh, to read. And he confronts Israel and says, look, you asked for a king. You demanded a king, and that's what God gave you. And I listened uh, to God. But he says, you know, see your wickedness in doing this in, Second Samuel, uh, in 1 Samuel 12, 17. And that you're going to see the consequences of what you've done. And so they ask, well, what do we need to do? And he says, repent, follow the Lord. God's still going to, uh, to work in this system of kings. Despite your sin, despite your failure, God is still going to bring his, uh, his purposes um, about. Okay, so now Saul is going to be the king. He is God's anointed for the time being. Um, but we see Saul's decline in chapters 13, 14, 15. It's kind of the three strikes and you're out. Okay? And so in chapter 13, we see Saul's premature sacrifice. Samuel tells him, do not make a sacrifice until I'm there. There's a battle, to be fair, taking place, and Saul is afraid. And so he's like, I, give me the, the robe. I'm going to put it on. I'll do the sacrifice so we can go in and fight the battle. Right, this kind of mentality of you know when you're under pressure, I'll disobey God so I can obey God in the larger thing of what God wants, and so and if, you know this is how sin usually is is uh, he does the sacrifice and then Samuel gets there right so the timing uh, if he had just waited and obeyed the Lord um, it wouldn't have been as much of an issue but now God informs him your kingdom Saul your line is not going to last your house is done. In 1 Samuel 13, uh, verses 13 and 14, Samuel tells him, you've acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of Yahweh your God, which he commanded you. For now Yahweh would have established your kingdom uh, over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not endure. Yahweh has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and Yahweh has appointed him as a ruler over his people, because you have not kept what I have commanded you. Okay, so Saul's already told you, your house is not going to last uh, forever. 
And God could have incorporated Saul's house and lined it up with, um, with the house of David. Uh, because David will be Saul's son-in-law, so there is a, a connection that will be between them. So he could have, you know, established Saul's house and David's house, uh, but God removes uh, Saul and says, your neighbor, your, who is better than you, will become king, a man after my own heart. Saul doesn't know who that is. Um, but in the, then chapter 14, Saul is not an effective leader in a military sense, he does have some victories, but we see that his son Jonathan is not like him. He goes and fights these battles, he wins, he does honor the Lord. Saul gets frustrated and makes a foolish vow in, uh, in chapter um, uh, 14. And his vow is this, nobody eats until we kill off all these guys and you bring me a winning victory in this battle. Which means, you know, you, the beatings will continue until morale improves, right? That uh, an army marches on its stomach. You, you know, and Jonathan doesn't know. And he says, anybody who eats before this battle has a victory on our side, that person needs to be put to death. Jonathan doesn't hear this because he's off fighting with two guys taking out a whole camp of Philistines. And he takes some honey and eats it. And now everyone's like, King's son just broke the vow. And uh, now the men go in after this, and they once they have a victory, they're cooking up this meat, but they don't pour out all the blood. So now they're all defiled. So Saul gets even more mad and starts confronting everybody about this when he was the one that, that caused the problem. Then he says, you know, even if, he goes, who, who ate um, and broke the, the fast that I, I commanded everybody? Even if it's my son Jonathan, I'm going to kill that person. And sure enough, it was Jonathan. Jonathan says, it was me. <laughs> and, and, uh, but the people don't allow Saul to kill Jonathan because they say, this isn't right. You can't kill John. They actually respect Jonathan in a way more than Saul, right? Because you see Saul sticking with something dumb that he's, and sinful that he said and did um, instead of saying, okay, I was wrong. I spoke you know, foolishly. And then in chapter 15, we get the third strike. Samuel, uh, Saul is out. He is told to go kill uh, the Amalekites, He's to go, uh, who's led by the king uh, Agag. Not take any spoil, devote everything to destruction. And he goes, does have a victory, but takes a bunch of spoil and takes the king captive, Agag. Brings him back. And Samuel is told by, by God, Saul is done kingdom is torn from him. It's over. And go tell him. And Samuel weeps for him all night and then goes and has to confront Saul. And Saul doesn't come out with his hat in his hand and say, I didn't complete the job. I didn't obey the Lord. He comes out and says, I won. I did it. I did exactly what God said. And Samuel asks, why do I hear sheep? And he, why do I hear livestock? He goes, oh, well, we took those, the people wanted them, and I thought, you know, why don't we take these and we can make a sacrifice to the Lord? So it's like, this is, you know, it's a super, it's not what God said, it's super obedience. I had a better plan that God didn't take into account that I could take these things and, and we could make a really great sacrifice. And that's where Samuel says that famous verse, to obey uh, is better than a sacrifice. That's not what God said. And to hearken than the fat of ram. So we see the king needs to be uh, obedient to God's word. And this is super frustrating. Uh, we can see all of our nature in this, but uh, Saul's response is to Samuel, I did obey. He says, I, I did obey uh, the Lord in disobeying him, is what, what he says. So um, one note for studying Esther later, um, Haman, the bad guy in Esther, is an Agagite, a descendant of Agag and the Amalekites. Mordecai and Esther are descendants and of the family of Benjamin and Kish of Saul. So it comes up, the problem has long-standing consequences for later um, in, in biblical history. And so because Saul didn't act here, it's going to, going to affect his uh, family and the Jews in Persia during that time. Okay, so uh, Samuel tells him here in uh, 15... Uh, that God has uh, removed the throne from him, has torn uh, the throne from him. 
uh, that he is in First Samuel fifteen twenty three he has rejected you uh, from being king. Okay, so we have Saul was the the people's choice, but God has shown by contrast this is the wrong type of king. And so we get in First Samuel sixteen, uh, we get the picture of the right king. We get David. He's in Bethlehem. He's a shepherd, and it's in and he is approached by Samuel. He's the youngest. Um, Samuel's looking for, of the sons of Jesse, which one's going to be the king. And he's looking around and David's out in the field and he's like, do you have any other sons? Because none of them are the one that God has chosen. And David comes in and God indicates to Samuel, yep, this is the one. And uh, uh, David is anointed by Samuel at this point, 1612. Arise, anoint him for this is he, right? Then it talks about the spirit of Yahweh came mightily upon David. He has this anointing for this role as king, this unique uh, work of the Holy Spirit. How we see that David is the right king, that God can give him amazing victory, that God can, if he has the right king who obeys him, that is the man after his own heart, that this can produce the kingdom of God, can produce conquest, um, is in chapter 17, one of the most famous Sunday school stories in the Bible, even if people aren't Christians, they know David and Goliath, right? And I think the problem with, uh, this is why it's good to go through the Old Testament, the problem a lot of times of how David and Goliath is treated is that we're David and we need to slay the Goliaths in our our lives. And well-meaning people have said that, but I think it's just they don't, they kind of get to Old Testament narrative and they're kind of like, how do we take this and make it applicable to the people? But this is the idea is that this is the right king. God gives, um, gives this type of victory over his enemies. And David even says throughout this passage, I'm doing this in the name of the Lord so that everyone will see that God is the true God. So that when God has the right king, he can do these, um, accomplish these amazing things, have victory over enemies, produce the kingdom of God uh, on earth. And this starts to indicate to Saul, yeah, I think David, uh, David is the one. Right? So we have Goliath's you know, famous challenge where he represents the Philistines. David represents the Israelites so that a victory for one of them is a victory for, uh, for the whole group. And um, David doesn't go out with armor. He goes out with his, his sling. There was a story in the news recently about a kid who rescued his uh, sister from getting kidnapped by hitting somebody with a slingshot. Um, I don't think it was a slingshot like this, but I think it was, you know, th- this type of slingshot. But kind of funny, but a sling is an effective, uh, pretty effective weapon. But I think kind of the significance from this is that we miss sometimes is David says, this Philistine is a blasphemer, blaspheming against God in God's land that he's given to us. The punishment according to the law for a blasphemer is stoning. David's going to stone um, a blasphemer. And so that's what he does. He kills uh, Goliath, beheads uh, Goliath, and gives uh, God the glory. Now Israel starts to recognize that, yes, David David is the right uh, right man. Um, And we'll continue to see that. It's a long time. It's not until uh, 2 Samuel 5 where David's the king over all united Israel as one kingdom. It's a matter of a couple decades before David gets there, because God tests David uh, in the wilderness. God tests David through this time of being patient to become king in the right way, uh, and David will often get in his own way. Um, but we do see that he is the man that God has chosen. He does have a heart for God, um, and kind of the thing to be aware of as Second Samuel and First Samuel are ultimately one book is. The uh, rise of David goes like this. It goes up through 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 7 is the kind of the mountain peak. Uh, and then 8 and 9 uh, is really good as well. And then 10 and 11 is we see David's sin and decline. That even though he is God's chosen man to define what a king is, he cannot complete the job because David's um, a great sinner. You know, he is uh, guilty before God. Uh, in need of God's forgiveness, and therefore David, even in the Psalms and in Second Samuel, looks ahead to, there needs to be another king, there needs to be a perfect king uh, who can really do my job, who can really produce uh, the kingdom of God, um, and that's not me. But David does recognize that this king's going to have to overcome 
sin. He's going to have to overcome the curse, Psalm 22. He's going to have to overcome uh, death in Psalm 16. Um, and he's going to have to um, be an eternal king to reign uh, over God's kingdom forever. So there, the deity of the Messiah is also uh, spoken of in the Psalms um, and lots of places in the Old Testament, but relative to David. Um, so didn't make it, but we'll have to quit there. I'll have to tell Brett. Are you okay with starting in First uh, Samuel 18? Brett loves uh, first So Samuel. maybe, yeah, maybe it's not such a bad uh, problem after all. So good problem for him to have. So, uh, But anyway, so uh, I'll, I'll close us in prayer, and then we will uh, go to worship. Lord God, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word and just seeing um, in books that we don't even view necessarily as theological, as just being history, Lord, that we see that you are working your plan of what it means to be king, uh, of what that what is necessary uh, to be king, Lord, and that uh, while David is a, a great man and the prototype is that he is not sufficient, uh, and he knows that, um, and looks ahead to the uh, need for the, the kingship of, of Christ, uh, Lord, that would center around his uh, full forgiveness of sins that's accomplished through his death and resurrection, Lord. So uh, we just pray that um, we uh, show the same hope uh, as David, that we have a greater appreciation for what is necessary uh, for the Messiah to even do and be, that not just uh, death for our sins and personal salvation, but that uh, Christ purchased a kingdom for you to bring about uh, your purposes on this earth to your glory, Lord, and that we get to be uh, a part of that um, as you call people to yourself, Lord. And so uh, we are representatives that your gospel, your kingdom goes to the ends of the earth, Lord, that Christ does have and will continue to have that victory. So, Lord, we just pray that our hearts would be uh, led to worship of, uh, of Christ, uh, that we would give him uh, his due uh, weight that the word uh, places on him, Lord, that you have given him, and that we would be uh, totally focused on uh, honoring him um, as our king. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.